I want to just, uh, before we jump into our Bibles, I want to just kind of give a couple of, uh, at least one commercial here. We, uh, we have two different missionaries, two of our missionaries that are coming off the field this summer, one for, I think, eight months, the other one for a year, and uh, they're coming from two different parts of the world. They speak English, uh, but we want to provide housing for those missionaries on their furlough. It's been in the bulletin. All the details are still in there. I'm hoping that there are a couple of you in this service who maybe you have the means, you have a rental somewhere, or you have a daylight basement type of thing where there's privacy for you know, a couple and a kid or two to, to stay there. Uh, we would just be deeply appreciative to be able to afford, uh, you know, give them affordable housing. If not for free, that would be ideal. And I'm just asking any of you in this service today, if that is something you're capable of doing with the resources you have, please let us know. Uh, they're going to be coming home here pretty soon, and we would love to be able to talk to you about that. So thank you for that very much. All right, um, open your Bibles. Let's get them open to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I don't know if you've ever done this, but it's always been compelling to me to study the last words of people, especially influential people, toward the end of their lives, if they're Christians, toward the end of their ministries. And I think some of the most profound thoughts and insights surface in the face of our mortality, and that is certainly the case for the Apostle Paul. There's no exception uh, that he is to this rule. It's common knowledge that his two New Testament letters to Timothy are most likely Paul's last letters before his death at the hands of the Roman emperor and psychopath Nero. And what Paul chooses to say in the last chapter of one of the last New Testament letters that he ever wrote is packed with warning and meaning and importance, not only for the church at large, but for every single one of us individually. And I would say that um, as we look at the Apostle Paul's teaching today in 1 Timothy 6, uh, it will be quite... I think, surprising as to what he chooses to focus some of his last teaching on earth on. So if your Bibles are ready, let's stand for the reading of God's Word as we always do. We just absolutely believe in the sheer power and divine origin of the words in our Bible, and we actually believe that these words can change our lives. So we stand in respect and ex expectation of that. Let's pick it up in verse 3. Paul writes, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy and dissension and slander and evil suspicions and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. But those who desire to be rich, they fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmless desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierce themselves with many pangs. Now let's go practically all the way to the end in verse 17 as he wraps up his teaching ministry on earth here. He says, verse 17, As for the rich in this present age, charge them, encourage them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. And here it is, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Hey, as our prayer time today, I want us to repeat together the Lord's Prayer. We're going to do it Catholic style, so we're going we're to use the word trespasses instead of debts. How many of you grew up praying the Lord's Prayer, either in home or at church? Yeah. Let's do it together as it comes up on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen, or amen, whichever you prefer. All right, please be seated. How many of you said amen? I want to know. Yep. Those are you, all you former Catholics. That's how we did it anyway. Still a wonderful prayer to focus our hearts on the goodness of God. Church, I'm curious as to why Paul would spend so much effort and energy writing on the topic of our relationship to resources, to money, to giving. Here's what we know that's going on here. Paul is writing to a pastor named Timothy. Timothy is pastoring a church in a city in the New Testament called Ephesus. I've been there. I know it exists. Ephesus was the Seattle or the Bellevue or the Edmonds of its day. It was a beautiful waterfront city with beautiful architecture and a very robust and diverse economy. It was a port city. And so there were lots of different nationalities and and foreigners that came through that city all the time and lived in that city. And on top of that, there was an incredible influence of a lot of pagan religions. And so Paul is giving some counsel here. He's counseling followers of Jesus who are trying to live the Christian life amongst a people and in a culture that has almost an obsessive pursuit of prosperity and success. He's writing to us to show us that there is a way to live the Christian life in a way that honors God, glorifies God, and is truly life for us while we're still here on this earth in the midst of all the pressures that there are to try and make money and succeed. A leader of the persecuted church in Romania once observed, and I think it's still true today, he said, in my experience, 95% of believers who face the test of persecution pass it, while 95% who face the test of prosperity fail it. I think it's still true. Here's what we know. We know that the lack of money or the loss of money can cause us great worry and stress, even to the point of losing our trust in God. We also know that the abundance of money or plenty can make us proud. It can make us greedy. It can make us covetousness, even developing in our hearts an independent spirit from God. Well, we don't need God quite as much because we have everything we need. We know that the over-pursuit of money can cause us to compromise our priorities. It can make us grow lukewarm in our worship and our prayer and our service to God, even causing some, as Paul writes here, to wander away from the faith altogether. But here's what we also know, that money in the hands of the godly can be a divine source of mercy to the needy, can be a a divine source of the spread of the gospel and the salvation of many souls and also can be a source of true life for the believer who relates and understands their money biblically. Listen, the truth is many believers are struggling in this area, and I would suspect that it's no different here at Canyon Hills. There are many of you who are struggling to trust and understand what God says in this area of your discipleship, your money. And so Paul gives us the first thing we need in order to pass the test, as that Romanian pastor mentioned, the first thing we need in order to to live a life that is truly life is we need a sound financial doctrine. Doctrine, not a plan, but doctrine. Out of all the things Paul mentions in this chapter, the one he expounds on the most is money. And he's reminding us that if we have bad teaching and practice in this area of our discipleship, it will really mess up our lives. If you look at verse 3, he reveals the two kinds of teaching that are in churches today. It's either one or the other. There's no third one. In verse 3, Paul says, if anyone teaches a different doctrine or what we would call a false doctrine, he says that's, that's, there's that kind of teaching going on. They're teaching something different than what Jesus says or what the Bible says. 
he says, and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness. That's the second kind of teaching. The words of Jesus or something different. Paul tells us here that there are dangers and devastating effects of choosing or listening to the wrong teacher, the wrong religious teacher, or the wrong religious teaching. He's saying here, listen, you need to be discerning because if you're listening to the wrong stuff, especially in the name of the Bible or Christianity or the church, you are going to experience some really bad consequences. Look at verses 4 and 5. Speaking of the teacher himself, he says he's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing if he's teaching something other than Jesus' words. He has un an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, and then here's the effect that it has in our lives. He says here, it produces envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth they imagine that godliness or being a Christian is a, is a means to gain or profit. It's not pretty. And we desperately need more and more of you, of followers of Jesus, to be discerning as to what teaching you're listening to, especially in the area of our resources and finances. Verses 9 and 10 talk about the devastating effects of listening to the wrong financial teaching or financial doctrine in your life. Look at verses 9 and 10. It, this gets ugly quick. But those who desire to be rich, that's the false teaching. That's the wrong teaching. That's the kind of teaching that's been spewed all over the church now for decades in Western Christianity. Desire to get rich. Get, God wants all Christians to have everything they want, to, to, to be wealthy, and, and, and that's the teaching that is wrong. He's saying those who desire that will fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. He's talking about the wrong teaching of wanting to get rich. Again, this stems from a lot of false teaching in the church, that God wants everyone healthy and wealthy and to have everything you want because you're a child of the king. That, that verb there, want or desire to be rich, there in verse 9, it's what we call a present participle in the Greek, and it's a continuous or repeated action. In other words, he's not talking about a one-time thing where you, you kind of just go out and make a silly purchase. He, he's talking about a consistent, consuming way of life of desiring more than you have. He calls it a love of money. And he says here in verse 10, it's a root it is a root that grows up other evil things in our hearts, so much so that they have the power, these things, to destroy our faith, to plunge us into total ruin and destruction. Isn't it any wonder that the Hebrew writer encourages us, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Why? Because God said, I will never leave you, neither will I forsake you. The richest man who ever lived on the face of the earth, ever, Solomon, had more money and more stuff than any human being today, even the wealthiest of our day. He wrote these words, whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. Let me just stop there. That's a test of whether or not your love for money is too strong, is you just never feel like you have quite enough. You're never satisfied with your income. You're always trying to figure out how to figure out how to make more, get more. He says, listen, that's a sign that you love, too, you love money too much. He says, it's meaningless. As goods increase, what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. Here's what C.S. Lewis says about this. He says, listen, he who has God in everything has no more than he who has God alone. I think that's what Paul is saying. Some of you are old enough to recognize the name John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil Company, and he controlled over 90% of America's refineries and pipelines in the early 20th century. 90% of all the oil in our country was his. Does that tell you how rich he was? And look what he says, the poorest man I know is the man who has nothing but money. 
Now, without knowing it, Rockefeller was agreeing with the Apostle Paul here in this passage. It's critical for us to have biblical doctrine that guides and guards our relationship with money. And so Paul says, listen, the first thing we need is make sure you're listening to the right teaching. And the right teaching comes from God and His Word. The second thing that needs to happen, or that we need to know when we have sound teaching in place, is that sound financial doctrine produces miraculous returns in our lives. And I call them miraculous because these returns are so rare and they do require divine intervention. One return is for this life, he's going to tell us. The second return is for the next life. But Paul says, listen, when you're listening and practicing the right teaching about this stuff, there's going to be something different in your life. I want you to look at verse 6 through 8 for the first one. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. The first miracle is the miracle of contentment. And isn't that a rare thing today, to truly know and be content? The Greek word for content means to have all we need. A little deeper into the word, it means total sufficiency of life within oneself due to the indwelling presence of Christ in the believer. It means to, to be totally sufficient right where you're at. The English Puritan preacher Jeremiah Burroughs wrote one of the greatest classic Christian books in, in literature, and he wrote it in 1648. When was the last time you read, read a book written in 1648, right? It's still in print today. The title of the book is this, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, and this is what he says, listen. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly supply in every and any condition. Now, let me say it again. Listen to his description. Contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of mind that comes from freely trusting and submitting to God no matter what we have or don't have. That is the first miracle Paul describes here that happens when we are obeying sound teaching. Paul connects in this passage godliness and contentment. Did you see it there? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness and contentment are really, really close cousins. In fact, I thought about this week. I don't think you can have one without the, without the other. I don't think you can be godly and not be content. And I don't think you can be content without being godly. Not in the Christian life, anyway. Paul marries them together. And he says that the two together are great gain for our lives. And if that is true, then the opposite must be true as well. If godliness with contentment is great gain, then godliness without contentment is great what? Loss. The opposite is true. The Christian life without contentment has a very big, dangerous hole in that life. Listen to what Thomas Watson writes, another Puritan preacher from the 17th century. He says, oh then, how excellent is contentment, which prevents sin in many temptations. Discontent is a devil that is always tempting. It makes a breach in the soul, and usually at this breach, the devil enters in by a temptation and storms the soul. The devil knows that he who is discontent will attempt anything. They'll do anything. Satan takes great advantage of our discontent. He loves to fish in these troubled waters. How many have made devastating choices in their lives due to not being content? I don't know if you grew up poor or if you grew up well-to-do or somewhere in the middle. But growing up poor and growing up wealthy both have a very real and present danger for our lives as we get older. Growing up poor can give you a sinful hunger for more things, more and more things. I never had, therefore I want. Growing up wealthy can give you a sinful hunger for everything. I've always had everything I wanted, therefore I will always get what I want. Both of those are dangerous. And so what's the miracle 
What's the key to this miracle of being content? What has to change in our mindset, in our attitudes? Paul says it right here. There are three realities that we have to believe in order to even begin to know true contentment. The first one is, is he says, we got to realize we brought nothing into the world. Now, that seems really obvious and really simple. Preacher, tell me something I don't know. But when was the last time you actually thought about that? That when you came into your existence with nothing, you brought nothing with you, including your very life. In fact, everything that we do have is from God. It's a manifestation of His ongoing love for us. Look at verse 17. He says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. In other words, don't be proud. Don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of money, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. That's the key. We brought nothing into this life, and the things that we do have are from Him in order to remind us of His love. So the first thing, if we're ever going to know how to be content with where we are in our life, not just financially, but in every part of life, our careers, our family, whatever, we got to remember we didn't bring it anything in. The second thing is we're not taking anything out. He says it in verse 7 as well. Nothing in this world that we have is going with us. Preacher, you're being overly obvious here. I know, but this is the stuff discontent people forget. This is what we tend to forget. Solomon, the richest man who ever lived on the earth, wrote this, naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. You're not carrying anything with you. That's key if we're going to ever know the miracle of contentment. The psalmist wrote it this way, Do not be overawed when a man grows rich, when the splendor of his house increases, for he will take nothing with him when he dies. His splendor will not descend with him. Now, translation, look at those words. He's saying, listen, don't get jealous when your neighbor gets a new kitchen. Don't get all worked up when that neighbor drives up again in a new car. They just got a new car two years ago. Here's another new car. Don't get, he's saying, listen, don't become covetous. Don't get envious when, when your friends or your other family members or your neighbors just seem to be constantly increasing in success and stuff, and it's always newer. He says, don't pay attention to that. He says he's going to take nothing with him when he dies. And look what he says here. His splendor will not descend with him. What do you think the assumption is there? I think the psalmist agrees with Jesus in the other words of the New Testament, where it's harder for a, a person with a lot of stuff and a lot of money to get into heaven than anyone else. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a wealthy person. And I think the psalmist is realizing, listen, if your neighbor is so obsessed with more and more and new and new and bigger and bitter and better and more success more than likely their God of choice is not the God of heaven, it's the God of this world, money. And if that's the case, they're not ascending to heaven when it's over. Don't envy them for a minute. And a third reality that we need if we're ever going to experience the miracle of contentment is we got to realize food and clothing are our only real needs. I know that sounds a little overly simplistic, but according to Scripture, it's true. We will lose our contentment and make bad financial decisions when our wants replace our needs, when wants become our needs. That's why in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches with crystal clarity on this subject. The very first public sermon Jesus preached, the Sermon on the Mount that we have recorded in the Bible, he talks about this subject all over the place. And he teaches that if we seek Him and His kingdom rule in our lives, that He will personally see to it that we will have everything we need. Again, referring back to Jeremiah Burroughs, he explains that achieving contentment is a lot like a mathematical equation. Listen to this. He says, a Christian comes to contentment not so much by way of addition as by subtraction, not by adding more to his condition, but rather by subtracting from his wants and desires so as to make his wants and desires and his circumstances equal. In other words, he's saying, we become content not by adding more, but by wanting less. It's exactly what Paul is talking about here. The psalmist said it in 34.10, they that seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. 
So the first miracle in the life of a believer with sound financial doctrine is contentment for this life, that rare jewel of contentment. And it starts with realizing we didn't bring it with us, we're not taking it with us, and basically all we really need is food and clothing. Everything else is a blessing above that. What's the second miracle? It's the miracle of treasures in heaven. There's an account in heaven with our name on it, and it's growing through an automatic deposit program down here. We find this alluded to in verse 19. He says, when we're living by sound financial doctrine in our lives, he says, we'll be storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they, will, they may take hold of that which is truly life. So this passage opens up this whole topic of rewards in heaven or treasures in heaven. We don't have time to develop that now. But it's safe to say, let's just make sure we know, it's safe to say that salvation or going to heaven is a matter of God's work for us through Jesus on the cross. Going to heaven is 100% dependent on what God has accomplished for us through Christ. We get that. But in contrast, treasures in heaven are a matter of our work for God. And we have compounding rewards growing in heaven, and the God of this universe is the one doing the compounding. Let's let C.S. Lewis again help us explain this principle. If you read history, he says, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next one. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. Aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. That's powerful, isn't it? Here's what Paul is basically saying. Live by true biblical doctrine when it comes to your finances, because the best is yet to come. That's what he's saying. This life has many blessings. This life has a lot of good, wonderful things that God allows us to enjoy. Absolutely. But Paul says, listen, God withholds a lot of this stuff because he never wants us to forget that the very best is still coming for those who love Jesus and have surrendered their hearts to him. There are treasures in heaven beyond our wildest imaginations. And that's why Jesus says, listen, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So be careful. So how do we aim at heaven in this life? How do we avoid the danger of living as though this life is all there is? How does contentment and heavenly treasures become a reality in our lives now? Here's Paul's main idea for the passage. It's simple. The true life is the giving life. That's his whole point. He shows us the disciplines and practices that will produce these miracles in our life, both now and in the future. And the first discipline or practice that comes from correct, sound financial doctrine is this. We need to be rich in good works. We need, we need to give of our most valued commodity, time. And that's what we see in verse 18. They are to do good, to be rich in good works. It sounds simple, doesn't it? He's implying personal involvement with people who are in need. Help people who are in need. Be rich, be generous with your most valuable commodity, your time. Help people in need. Simple. Or is it? Can I ask you a question? When was the last time you took some time on your day off, your precious day off, to help somebody in need? Truly. When was the last time in the little time that you have free, did you, did you give any of it to helping someone else in need? Now, I know hundreds and hundreds of you can answer that question quickly in your mind, and to you, I want to give some love to we have hundreds of you sitting in here who are a part of our car care and home care for our senior citizens and our widows and our single moms. Four times a year, we have a ministry to help with needs in their homes and their cars if they have needs. And hundreds of you, we just had this last Saturday. The Saturday before that was car care, and so many of you volunteered your time on a Saturday. 
to help people in need. Praise God for you. The hundred of you or so every week that, that volunteer in our food bank to make that happen. The hundreds of you who volunteer every Sunday, your day off, but you stay in extra service. You don't just come to get fed and to worship, but you come to serve others. And you're serving here on Sunday mornings, just people who need your gifts and need your encouragement. You're doing it, and I praise God for you. See, what happens is when our thoughts and our cares get all tangled up in the cares of this life and stuff, then our heart won't choose to serve God or others. There will always be a worry. There will always be a worldly duty. There will always be an excuse to keep us from serving and from being rich in good deeds and good works. We'll always have something we, we need to do first or we need to do in our minds most. And so we go week after week, month after month, year after year in our lives, barely, if ever, giving of our most precious commodity, our time, to helping others. Discontent takes our minds and hearts off God. So Paul says, listen, here's the doctrine, be rich in good works. The second one is similar, be generous. Be a generous giver. Verse 18 they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Now, this doesn't need a lot of explanation, but the implication is revolutionary. Paul is saying that God is saying through His Word, give it away so that you won't run out. That's what he's saying here. The answer is not to want more and to get, get more and to, and to love money and to, and to want to get richer or more, just get more in the bank. He's saying that's not the answer. It doesn't work, Paul is saying. Listen to me, he's saying. Have right teaching in this. You've got to include God in this part of your discipleship, he's saying. Give it away so you won't run out. Now notice, it's not either or. I have people say to me, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not giving, but I am volunteering a lot. Or someone else will say, preacher, I don't have a lot of time, but I do give. Listen, Paul doesn't give us that option. The Christian life doesn't have that option. Sound doctrine in this part of our lives includes our time and our money. That's why when Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 9, he said, you will be enriched, you will be blessed in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. In other words, God loves faithful giving, and He will give more to faithful givers so that they can give more away. We give more to give more. That is a biblical principle. We give more to give more. This does not agree with the false teaching of the prosperity gospel in our day and age that treats God like a vending machine. Their mantra is, we give more to what? Get more. It's the exact opposite, and that kind of teaching is being spewed all over churches in Western culture today, and it's wrecking people's faith. Give so that you can get more for you. Give, and God will fill it up for you. No! That is wrecking the faith of Christians all over our country. They're getting frustrated. They're getting embarrassed. They, they feel like if, if they don't get more than everyone around them, then, then God's, God must be disappointed with them. Or God doesn't love them enough. Or they haven't earned His love enough. And it's just destroying Christians. And it's destroying the work of the gospel because you can't take that message to world, third world countries. You can't stand up in the pulpit and preach that nonsense under a tree in Africa or New Guinea, or Russia, or Chile. You can't preach that gospel. Why? Because it's a false gospel. Put in a quarter and believe that God owes you something. What? Paul's talking about a generosity that does see God as the fountain that's always on so that our cup is always full so that we can overflow in generosity not so that we can overflow in more. Because that, if it's His way, then it's for His glory. And so the question is, do we trust Him? 
Are we willing to give more in order to give more? And do we trust that his wisdom that contradicts worldly wisdom in this area contradicts it to show that God's foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom? It seems foolish to our listening world. If there's any unbelievers in here right now, you're shaking your head going, this is crazy. When is this service over so I can get out of here? You're saying to give more so we can give more? You're saying give more so you don't run out? Yeah. It is crazy because it's supernatural. It's God's wisdom. Is it any wonder Paul is so passionate about this towards the end of his life? Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, says this, giving is not God's way of raising money. It's his way of raising his children. Listen, don't, don't kid yourself by thinking that whenever the topic of money comes up, it must be, you know, God's running short, God's running out, the preacher's up there asking for money. No, I'm not. God's not run out of anything. But what I know in my heart of hearts, if you, Christian, I'm speaking of, if you don't get this, you are going to run out, and the first thing you're going to run out of is contentment, that beautiful inner peace that comes from trusting God. Let me give us two sobering tests to see if we're trusting Him. Let's just see how we're doing real quick. I want to give you two tests to just kind of look in the mirror of these two tests. The first one is what I would call the couch test. The couch test. You ever heard of it? It's said that the average home annually loses about $100 of loose change in their couch cushions every year. Okay? So I did a little research, and I went to our stewardship office here at the church. I had them do the research, not me. And here's what they found out. That 310 families in our church that call this their church home. This is where they come to church, they worship here, they love Jesus, I presume. 310 families that come here regularly have given less than $100 in the past year. What that means is that some of our couches are making more money than God is So what I want you to do today is I want you to go home and check your couches. And if there's more money there than you have given to the work of the gospel in the last year, the answer to the test is you're not passing. You're not trusting God. And you certainly cannot be content. So that's the couch test. The second test well, before we get to the second test, let me tell you another stat that came out of our stewardship office that was just as discouraging, really. Out of 1,882 households who give and support the ministry of Canyon Hills, 1,882 family units or households, some are single, some are married, some are, you know, single or married, doesn't matter, just households, okay? <laughs> I thought there was a third one, but there isn't, okay? <laughs> <laughs> So out of 1,882, here's what they told me. 601 families, 33%, gave less than $500 in the past year to the work of the Lord here through Canyon Hills. Now, why is that so discouraging? I'll tell you why. The average median household income in the area in which we live, the corridor from Kirkland to Linwood, is about $80,000 per household per year. Not per individual, but per year. What that means is there's an equal number of people that live in our community that their household's income is more than that and an equal number where it's less than that. The, the median is eight, about 80,000. So if our church is a representation of the community that we live in, let's just say that's true for us. Some make more in their homes. There's the dual incomes or you know, bigger incomes and some less, but the average what that tells us is that there are 600 families in our church that are basically giving at a level that says that their household income is $5,000 a year or less. And we know that's impossible. 
I told you there were two tests. The second one is the tax test. Right now, there's a, th- a looming threat in the federal court system with an organized, lawyered-up group who is challenging the constitutionality of allowing a tax deduction for religious contributions in our country. They are claiming that it is, it is a uh, breach of the separation of church and state by giving people who give to religious institutions a tax break. Well, let me ask you something. If the court rules in favor of removing the tax benefit of your giving, would you continue to give? If there was no longer a tax write-off for your contributions, would you still do it? Would you still trust God that His economy still works? Let me ask you a second question. Would you ever dream of giving more? without a tax write-off. I didn't do the research on this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that our country is one of the few countries in the world that have this benefit for giving to religious work. One of the few. I think it's less than three that I could imagine. It's probable that in our lifetime, this benefit's gonna be gone. What will happen to you? If God should choose to allow that blessing to go away, would you still trust Him? Two tests, your couch and your taxes. Paul is saying good works and generous giving are the only antidotes for keeping our faith, keeping our money from blowing up our faith. And so the point is that we should, be, we should be controlled and governed by lavish, sacrificial, generous giving of our time and our money. And the standard for our giving is to be a picture of the love of Christ on the cross. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, We're called to know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for our sake He became poor. So we give of our time and money in accordance with the gospel of a Savior who emptied himself completely so that we would have every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. We would have salvation from God's coming wrath upon the wicked and the unbeliever. We would have, we would have forgiveness of our sins. We would have our sins removed. We would have peace with God. We would have the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing us of our future eternal inheritance, our treasures in heaven. That is the Savior who emptied himself. And so practically speaking, I want to talk to, or I want to encourage two kinds of believers that are sitting here before you leave. The first believer that I want to talk to right now is those of you who are not yet tithing. You may be giving something, but you're not tithing. And I want to ask you, would you be willing to obey God and trust God in this area of your life and start tithing even next Sunday or next time you get paid? Would you be willing to say, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to look forward to those miraculous results and returns in my life? Would you be willing to immediately start to grow in your contentment and your godliness and the great gain that God has for you as you trust Him in this area? I want to call you to do that. This part of your discipleship is just as real as every other part. Trust God. Could you imagine what we could do in terms of mercy to the needy, spreading the gospel to the lost, if 601 more families just stopped white-knuckling it and let loose of what God has blessed them with and give back to God so that the work can continue to exponentially explode with the gospel? Could you imagine if 600 more families in our church stopped living like this and just started saying, okay, God, I didn't bring it with me. I'm not taking it with me. It all came from you. I'm going to give you What's yours? 
The second group of people I want to talk to are those who are already giving. There are hundreds of you who are already tithing, and maybe you've been tithing since you were a child and you're faithful. I would ask you, would you consider growing in your tithing? Would you consider giving even more? I've often said to you over the years that a middle-class American Christian who's only tithing 10% is probably robbing God, Malachi chapter 3. In other words, we've become so accustomed to our Western prosperity and its ways of life that we actually think 5 or 10% is generous. I love preaching on this subject. I love it. It's a passion of mine. Here's why. As I'm preaching this morning, there's a whole bunch of you. You're smiling. You're nodding. You're agreeing. I'm confirming what's true in your life. You have let go. You have trusted God, and you're watching. The more you give, the more God blesses, and you keep giving, and it's like you keep giving so you don't run out. You can't explain it. It doesn't make sense. You shovel out. He shovels in, and he's got a bigger shovel, right? You know that. You're looking at me like, thank you for reminding me. I'm going to continue to be faithful. There's a whole another bunch of you who you're not there yet. You might be given here or there. It's not much. It's negligible. It's not even measurable. And you just, you just haven't done it. You just ignored it. You're not being obedient. You're not trusting God. And I'm praying that as you hear a message like this, you're going to be in the first group soon. And you're going to be willing to say, dang, he was right. Paul's right. God's right. It's so much more fun to live like this than like this, and it works. I don't, can't explain it. I can't explain it to you. It's there. It's true. God promises. He keeps his promises. That's all I can say. And some of you are going to start thinking today how you are going to get obedient and faithful and trusting in this area of your discipleship. I'm excited for you. There's a third reason I love preaching about this subject. Some of you right now are really upset. You're ticked off at me. You're put out. You're angry. Really, Steve? A sermon on giving on Kids Worship Sunday? Could you have picked any worse day? Some of you are thinking, how am I going to apologize to the person I brought to church today? I couldn't believe, I can't believe it. You finally got someone to just come and hang out with you at church. And sure enough, here I am talking about money. And you are embarrassed and, and, you're, and you're, you're, you're trying to figure out how, if you haven't already passed them a note saying, I'm so sorry, I didn't know. If you haven't done that yet, you're thinking about how to do that. Okay. I love this for you. Because you get to remember that God is sovereign. And God knew a million years ago who would be sitting in this room today. And it may be you thought you were bringing a friend or a family member to watch your kid up here turn around and pick their nose and sing. <laughs> right? But really, God had them here today for something different. God had you here today for something different. So I'm going to ask us, before we walk out, I'm going to ask all of us to bow our heads for about one minute. Would you do that? Just sit still for a minute. This is where we're going to do business with God. I'm wondering, those of you who aren't tithing, would you be willing to, right now, before you leave here, say, God, I am sorry. I repent of my sin, and I ask that you would forgive me and increase my faith in this area. Help me to believe, God. I want to give. I want to be faithful. I want to be content. So God, I submit to you, give me courage and faith today. For those of you who have been tithing, I'm wondering if you might take a minute and say, God, thank you for your abundant blessing. You've always been faithful. I have what I need. I have more than I need. Give me courage and faith to give more so that I can give more. Either one of those prayers, whichever one is yours, I'm going to give you a minute to just go to God with it.
God, we acknowledge in the name of your son, Jesus, that you are sovereign and that you choose the times and places that we live. You choose our lot and you draw the lines, God, of where we are financially, wealth-wise, whatever. God, you determine the blessings that you will pour into our lives. You also determine the blessings that you will withhold. God, remind us today that you are on your throne and that the best is still to come. Thank you, God, that you don't give us everything we want. You cause us to know that heaven and all of its treasures are waiting. God, we acknowledge today that you are good and that you do not keep your children from joy. You do not keep us from having the the happiness of all the, the, the things in this life that could be of such great joy for us. I praise you, God, that you don't withhold that. But I praise you, God, that you're wise enough to know how much and when. And so we trust you in your choices. God, I pray that this will be a church filled with truly, miraculously content children of yours. And may, God, we continue to give so that we can give even more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I, real, I realize that for some of you this was hard because you're unemployed or you're struggling in finances. You have debt up to here or you're underemployed. Listen, we want to pray with you before you leave. There'd be some people up here that would love to just pray for, for you and with you. We also realize that some of you are at a place in your life where you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus completely. You haven't stepped over that line and said, all right, I'm going to give my heart to him first before I start thinking about money. That needs to happen first. And I would encourage you, if you're ready to do that, turn from your sin and ask Jesus to be your Savior. We want to help you do that as well before you go home. All right? God bless you. I pray you're challenged today. I'll look forward to seeing you next Sunday.